Dr. Julie Gibson, and today I'm going to discuss an article on integrating APOL1 kidney risk variant testing in live kidney donor evaluation. This is an expert panel opinion piece that was published in Transplantation in October of 2021. We know that those of African ancestry have a higher incidence of developing ESRD, and we also know that APOL1 kidney risk variants play a large role in that. I want to point out that this is the way the article refers to this rather than using the term high risk genotype. As we will review, these patients are actually not considered to be at a high risk. Incidence of two APOL1 KRVs is highest among those of African ancestry, and it can vary even in this population depending on exactly what region. There is no prospective data on this, so the role of APOL1 testing in donor selection remains unclear. There's obvious need for more guidance on this as well, so the NIH has started the APOL1 Long-Term Kidney Transplantation Outcomes Network, or Apollo study, to help clarify the overall impact of this. The Apollo study is ongoing, but for now, the American Society of Transplantation's Living Donor Community of Practice has put together this committee that is comprised of several members of the kidney transplant physicians community, as well as a living kidney donor of African ancestry and also a bioethicist. This group produced this report as interim guidance while we wait for the Apollo results. There is a wide spectrum of APOL1-related CKD, and it can include nephropathy attributed to several other things. It is important to note, though, that most people with two APOL1 variants never actually develop ESRD. There generally has to be a modifying factor that occurs. This is referred to as a second hit. The things we know that can be a second hit are mainly viral illnesses to include HIV and also COVID. There's still not much data, though, on what other things actually might constitute a second hit. Interestingly, kidneys from deceased donors with the two APOL1 KRVs have already been associated with double the risk of graft loss. That is when compared to carriers of APOL1 or those with no APOL1 KRVs. Just like with native kidney disease, it may be that you still need a second hit to cause the graft to fail. This illustrates a small study that looked at APOL1 in LKDs. This included 136 LKDs that were all African American and were grouped by APOL1 status. It was found that those with two APOL1 KRVs had lower pre- and post-donation EGFRs and faster annual declines versus carriers or those with no APOL1 KRVs. However, there were only 19 in this group of 136 that had the two APOL1 KRVs. Out of that 19, two did develop ESRD. So for this cohort, that is 11%. Now, obviously we realize that this may not be the most accurate estimate given the small sample size. However, this is the available data on this topic and we will revisit this later when we get into the guidelines on donor counseling. This illustrates a much larger study of over 3,000 pan-ethnic 18 to 30-year-olds who were all considered suitable to donate a kidney. They were retrospectively assessed for development of CKD of at least stage three after 25 years. This showed, once again, that CKD risk is higher in those of African ancestry versus Caucasian, and again, showed that there's further risk among those with two APOL1 KRVs. Also, though, there were several relative contraindications for consideration of kidney donation, and those were shown to increase risk even further here. In this study, they also made a risk calculator for kidney disease, and based on that, they showed that having two APOL1 KRVs is actually about the same as some of the other risk factors that often arise here in donor evaluations. And those relative contraindications typically do not raise major concerns in isolation. This highlights the ethical dilemma we have with concerns over APOL1 KRVs. Let's now review the guidelines that were created based on this data. First, which LKD candidates should be educated on this? The committee decided that anyone who reports African ancestry should be educated. This can include discussion of lower risk based on the specific region of ancestry. They did point out that it is important to ask about ancestry specifically rather than relying on any assumptions or on the medical records. They also felt this counseling can be provided by any of the transplant team members, but that it needs to be under the guidance of a transplant nephrologist and it should be done early in the evaluation process. 
So who should we recommend this testing for? Anyone of African ancestry along with another known risk factor. This can include younger age of less than 44 because that might represent someone who is too young to know they might have a potential kidney problem. Male gender is also on the list because men are more likely to reach kidney failure sooner than women, even though we know that women have a higher overall incidence of CKD. In studies, men have been counted as having kidney failure at a younger age than women because they may have gotten dialysis or a kidney transplant sooner than women. It is important to note that if a donor has two or more of these risk factors, they can be unaffected by APOL1 and still have the same risk level for future CKD. They should be counseled about their risk level before even considering genetic testing. Regardless of any genetic test results, the program should still consider candidates if they still wish to donate. The program should then decide whether or not their risk level exceeds an acceptable threshold, which can be set by each transplant program. Next, when should this testing be done? The group decided that testing should be after the preliminary medical and psychosocial testing and not during the initial screening. This is for cost savings, but also gives an opportunity for physicians to counsel if there is some lab abnormality, for example. However, genetic testing can occur before HLA typing, cross-matching, or CT scanning because those are tests that are less likely to rule someone out from donation. What topics should be covered in counseling? They recommend acknowledging the lack of strong data on the topic of post-donation risk of kidney disease. They recommend that counseling should include discussion of that very small study that showed an 11% risk 12 years after donation in patients with two APOL1 KRVs. As a reminder, that was the study group that included just 19 patients. However, this is the best available data on that specific topic. Counseling should also include discussion of second hits and the lack of data around that. There should be discussion of the ongoing Apollo study so candidates can stay on top of those results. Further discussion points should include, but are not limited to, the lack of preventative treatments for APOL1-associated kidney disease, the risk to donor themselves, and also the risk to the potential recipient if they decide not to donate. To avoid the possibility of assumptions, counselors should review the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. This committee was supportive of a shared approach to making the decision between potential donor and the transplant center in the context of a positive test result. As with any other isolated findings of a single risk factor, anyone with two APOL1 KRVs should not be automatically excluded from consideration. There should be understanding of the relationship between the donor and recipient and how that may affect the potential donor's decision. Providers should always educate but have respect for donor autonomy. It should be realized that some candidates may wish to donate despite increased risk to themselves. Should transplant programs reveal the results of genetic testing to the recipient? This can be considered in light of potential increased risk to the recipient, but remember the available data on that is based solely on deceased donor kidneys. The committee decided it was more important to protect the donor's privacy unless they specifically consent to having those results disclosed to the recipient. So should a donor with two APOL1 KRVs be discouraged due to risk to the recipient? The committee decided no on this point. We do not have strong data on APOL1 affected living donor kidneys versus recipient outcomes. However, what we do have suggests that this type of kidney is still a better option than waiting, remaining on dialysis, or waiting for another kidney potentially from a deceased donor. In conclusion, the Apollo study will not report results for at least several more years, so these are intended only as interim guidelines for each transplant center to create their own protocol around. This testing is only recommended alongside appropriate counseling as outlined. This report repeatedly mentions concern that donor autonomy must always be a consideration. Lastly, they also recommend that there be no rush to judgment on the significance of APOL1 KRVs in living donors until more solid data on the topic exists. Hopefully these guidelines can become much firmer when the Apollo data is actually published, but this is a compilation from an expert panel based on the available data that we have now. Thank you for your time and I hope this was informative.